the city of the future. A little background on me. I'm from a town in South Florida. I grew up in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the town is called Deerfield Beach, and it's near Miami. Uh, it's home of palm trees and of sunny beaches, and also home of Disney World. I've probably been to Disney World around 20 times as a kid, but you'd be surprised that Disney World, or Magic Kingdom that you see here, is actually not my favorite theme park. My favorite theme park is Epcot. And Epcot is de dedicated to the celebration of human achievement, dedica dedicated to technology and also international cultures. Epcot is divided into two areas. One is called World Showcase, which you can see at the top of the screen, and the other one is called Future World. My favorite, child, uh, my favorite ride growing up as a child was the land. And the land was essentially a water taxi that went through a greenhouse and it also went through a hydroponic garden. And the, the ride was called Listen to the Land. Growing up, I also was a lover of sci-fi. Every day after school, I would watch Star Trek with my mom. And I actually think that uh, visiting Epcot as a kid and watching Star Trek uh, gave me my interest in the future, the city of the future, and in thinking about the environment and thinking about cities and our future. Fast forward, it's the 1990s, and I'm attending Cornell University. I'm actually studying agricultural engineering. Uh, somehow that ride as a kid, looking at the hydroponic garden, made me want to feed the world. That was my, what I wanted to do when I grew up. And my freshman year, I had a chance to take um, one course, a uh, freshman writing seminar, and I had 100 choices to take. And so I picked a course called Utopias and Dystopias. Utopia is an imagined state or place in which everything is perfect. A dystopia is an imagined state or place in which everything is unpleasant or bad, usually seen as a totalitarian regime or an environmentally degraded one. So essentially, you get the city that you want or you get the city that you end up with. So I would like everybody to close their eyes. Everybody has to close their eyes. Um, and I would like you to visualize the city of the future. You can open your eyes now. So I would put a bet on it that your city in your head probably looks something like this. Tall buildings, skyscrapers, uh, steel, glass, uh, or maybe it looks something like this. Uh, concrete from one of your favorite sci-fi movies. Or perhaps, since it's 2016, uh, it had a lot of technology in it. A lot of video screens, LEDs, automated cars. And uh, the funny thing is actually the form of the future of the city is probably not dependent on all those factors that you said, uh, that you thought in your mind, but actually on these. Population constraints, environmental issues, climate change, uh, scarcity of food and resources, and political instability. Those are probably the factors that are gonna determine this, uh, the future of the city. So where did we all get this idea that the future city was gonna look like one of those pictures? Uh, in order to understand that, we need to look at our past. And so in the ancient days, uh, people built buildings from what was ever around them, depending on their environment. So you might have clay, sand, rock, stone, uh, thatch, wood, sort of dependent on where you lived. And thinking about the future being steel and concrete is sort of what we think of the future. Um, so you'd be surprised to know that the tallest, I mean the oldest buildings in the world are actually made from wood. Uh, these are buildings that are over a thousand years old, uh, 10 stories to 18 stories high, uh, pagodas in Japan and also in China. And you have to understand that these buildings have gone through seismic issues, they've gone through earthquakes, they've gone through um, moisture conditions and they're still standing. Closer to where I live now, which is Portland, Oregon, uh, there's a building that's 100 years old. You can see on the image on the left, uh, an old growth uh, tree, which is probably where all of these buildings came from. And unfortunately, that's a resource that's not really available right now. And closer to home, uh, we have the tallest wood structure uh, standing here in Glavice at the radio tower. So uh, we've been doing this for a while. But then, in 1885, um, the first skyscraper, I say skyscraper, uh, was built, called the Home Insurance uh, Building in Chicago, and it stood at 10 stories high. 
And really, this building was made possible by uh, new technologies, such as iron framing, steel framing, uh, the invention of the elevator, uh, and the curtain wall. And you would think that these technologies are what caused the first skyscraper to be built. But actually, these were not uh, the reason why uh, that was built. The real reason was fire resistance. Because earlier, uh, in 1871, there was a great fire in Chicago. And this fire essentially took out 3.5 miles of the city of Chicago. The city of Chicago was full, filled with wooden buildings and wooden um, sidewalks. And around $200 million worth of damage was caused during this fire. And that was the reason uh, that those technology uh, advancements were made. And you also had fires in New York um, earlier, and two fires, actually three fires in, in San Francisco. The first two were fires, the, the third was a fire caused by an earthquake. And so essentially this led to, in the United States, a whole series of building regulations uh, that made uh, building buildings out of wood more restrictive. And essentially, uh, Made, made it so that you can't build buildings uh, more than six stories out of wood in the United States. And so the rest is history. Uh, skyscrapers dot the American uh, downtown skyline, and they're made out of steel and they're made out of concrete. Um, but this went further. This is in Singapore. Uh, most of the major cities in the world uh, look something like this. But while all this industry was booming and development was happening, there was also something else happening, which was basically our environment. It was degrading, it was changing. So we'll look at some, a few graphs. Uh, this one I found quite horrifying, more uh, going toward our dystopian future. But you can see on the red line, there's a line about the historic uh, levels of atmospheric carbon in our environment. And this is for the last 400,000 years. And you can see with this black dot, this is 1950. And you can see with this other black dot, uh, this is right now. And this came from uh, NASA's data. And so you can see there's uh, been a change <laughs> in the last um, years uh, that hasn't uh, been in our history and is not part of our cycles. Also, you have global temperatures obviously are on the rise. Uh, you have sea levels on the rise. And then the ice in the Arctic is at a low. And so you wonder, how do, how do buildings contribute to this? And basically, the making of buildings and also the operating of buildings, which are seen in yellow, account for, the, at least in the United States, the major energy usages um, in, in all, across all sectors, uh, more than industry, which is in dark blue, and more than transportation. And then, you know, how do we affect the carbon uh, by making and operating buildings? Well, you see on the other graph, um, it's almost equal to both industry and transportation. So buildings are contributing a lot. And unfortunately, these statistics make us think rather, uh, when we think of the future, as our dystopian future, as you can see uh, from this movie slide. So I want to take a moment and go to a parallel universe, completely different. I want to talk about the farm to table movement. And so similar to um, the building industry, uh, in ancient days, people got their food from the land. And, you know, it went straight from the farms right to your table. And as populations began to increase and there were famine and uh, food scarcity, uh, essentially uh, man had to kind of catch up. And in the 18th and 19th century, there was mass production, uh, agricultural production, uh, major machinery advancements, uh, the use of uh, synthetic pesticides, and more recently, genetically modified organisms. And this has led to a series of environmental issues such as soil erosion, nutrient loss, uh, deforestation, and water pollution. And also to health issues such as uh, chronic illness and obesity. And so there was a movement in the early 2000s on the west coast of the United States called the farm to table movement. And this movement was basically uh, the idea that you could take food from local farms and that those should kind of go to your tables, to your grocery stores, to your restaurants without uh, very much processing. And this movement really embraced sustainable practices such as organic farming, free range uh, husbandry, and also fair trade practices. And so this wasn't something new. <laughs> uh, this was really going to the past um, and thinking about how do we listen to the land. And so you're probably thinking, what does this have to do with the city of the future? 
Well, I'm a real estate developer in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I've been practicing for the last 10 years. Uh, this is an example of a building that I did. It's student housing, uh, off-campus student housing near the University of Oregon. Uh, this is another building uh, near the University of Oregon. It's six stories tall. And this is a building near Oregon State University. And you can see, you can't see, but you might wonder what do these, all these buildings have in common? And what they have in common is that they're all made from wood. And so the interior of all of those buildings, uh, the structure of the building is made from wood. On this particular building, the second, third, and fourth floor, the exterior of the building is also made from wood. But uh, unfortunately, this type of wood, which is called stick frame, um, uh, how, you know, making it with stick frame, is not fire resistant. Um, so we can't go farther in height than probably five or six stories. And this is another building uh, for Pacific Northwest College of Art. And even though the outside is metal and brick, uh, it is also made from wood. And you can see on the interior, we've um, reclaimed some wood from an existing building that, that was there earlier and used wood as an accent uh, for some of the spaces. And for, we have also smaller scale projects where there's an existing building made out of wood, which you can see the darker ceiling on the building, and then an introduction of wood from sustainably harvested um, farms, which is the lighter wood. And so really the use of wood interior and exterior. Uh, this is one of my most recent projects called Treehouse, which has an interior uh, really using wood in all different applications, um, be it on the entry of the building, uh, to the floors of the lobby, and then you can also see it's a seven-story building. And this building is probably the tallest building in the United States that you can build out of wood. The first two floors of the building are made out of concrete. Um, the next five uh, parts of the building are made out of wood. And this is, this is as good as it gets when it comes to wood. And so, uh, earlier last year, uh, my team won a competition. It was a $1.5 million grant from the United States Department of Agriculture uh, for a building called Framework. And uh, Framework, one of the reasons we won uh, was this idea of forest to frame. And it was modeled after the farm to table movement. So just like you get your food from a farm and it comes straight to your table, the idea is that you get wood um, from a local farm and that goes straight into our buildings. And it really uh, captured this uh, idea of this virtuous cycle. The idea that wood harvested from forests um, would go to the lumber mill, become an engineered wood product, go into the future tall buildings that fueled our sustainable cities. The building's 12 stories high, or will be 12 stories high, and it really is the idea of showcasing uh, wood by allowing this glass um, center that goes down the building to show off uh, that the building is made out of wood. And you can see in the lobby, the core of the building, the beams, the columns, the ceilings are all made out of wood. And really, you know, why couldn't we do this before? It's really based on a new technology called cross-laminated timber. And a lot of people like to cro call cross-laminated timber plywood on steroids. And this uh, technology was invented in Austria and Switzerland in, the 19, in 1990. And what it allows is basically tall buildings. Uh, the CLT is very strong. Uh, it spans large distances, but most important in the case of the United States, especially, uh, it's fire resistant. And it creates lighter buildings uh, that are faster to construct, uh, and it also um, uses less resources and energy to get done. And what's really important uh, for governments, uh, for institutions, uh, for local communities is that it can be a local product. And you can see that's why the government of the United States decided to fund such a competition. And it can also be an economic driver for rural communities that have lost uh, jobs that maybe manufacturing jobs that have gone away uh, can now have a new source of income. And it's not just cross-laminated timber that I showed you. There's a lot of other uh, wood products that are out there that can do the same job. And really what these uh, new technologies allow is a building like Framework, being at 130 feet tall, uh, it's just trying to rival the size of a tree, the tree that it would come from. But most important to this discussion of utopian and dystopian futures is the idea that you can take wood 
from a forest that normally the tree would die and release the carbon into the atmosphere. Rather than that happening, you can harvest those trees and the tree itself essentially uh, captures the carbon in, in its wood and you can sequester or hold that carbon in an actual building. And that carbon will stay there as long as the building is up. And so rather than that being released in the environment, you've, you've captured that and meanwhile, you've replanted a tree in that same forest. So it's seen as a climate change uh, mitigation and uh, is very important, I think, to the future. And when thinking about a wood building versus steel and a concrete building, um, there's a lot of data by independent researchers that show, uh, you can see in uh, orange, uh, a datum for the wood building, and then also for in green, for steel and concrete, there's a lot of potential with regard to um, reduction in smog, uh, less fossil fuel energy usage, um, also the global warming potential is much lower. And these buildings have been popping up everywhere, mostly in Europe for the last 10 years, uh, just in Canada for the last five years. And actually the tallest wood building is gonna be 18 stories high and it's under construction right now in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. And so just like the fire issues of the past in the 1800s uh, led to a steel and concrete age, many believe that our issues of global warming, our issues of environmental degradation will lead to a timber age. And here are some inspirational images, not necessarily tall buildings, uh, but inspirational images on buildings made out of wood. So this is a church in the United States. Uh, this is a museum in, uh, also in the United States. Uh, a museum in Japan. And you have a cultural center in New Caledonia. And really institutions are, are probably on the forefront of this uh, new technology and using it in their buildings. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of different institutions. Um, this one being in Canada and also in the UK. And really what's gonna make this industry take off is when real estate developers such as myself um, embrace this technology. And this is an office building in Switzerland. And you know, the, the sky's the limit. There's a lot of competitions going on right now. A lot of architects are engaged in this idea. And so these are a series of images um, of a futuristic, a utopian futuristic view of what the city of the future may look like. And so I would like you to take a minute, you don't have to close your eyes, to visualize the city of the future. My hope is that when you do this, you think of wood. Thank you. <laughs>